Ah, yes, guys. How are you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone has been with me for the last hour and a half outside trying to record this video, but for a number of reasons, it didn't work. The battery on the thing on the camera kept dying. She was barking too much. It was too hot. In a nutshell, the whole thing was terrible. So we're going to try it again right now. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love on this Tuesday, 25th of June. The 2024 version of such day. Tottenham transfer news, views, and clues update. We've got a lot to get through, but before we can get into any of that, I've got to spend a couple of seconds apologizing because I'm a little bit embarrassed, really, if I'm entirely honest. Uh, yesterday's video, I stuck it up. I recorded it earlier when I first saw the link saying that uh, Jimenez was very close to Tottenham. In the video, I was like, oh, I don't even know if this is like, what am I doing here with regards the fact that he's a Dutch player, he's a Mexican player playing in Holland, moving to the Premier League, and the first person who's got a sniff of the story is a radio disc jockey in Colombia. I mean, it didn't smell right. And then, obviously, we went on anyway with the video, like like you, like you do. Uh, edited it, uploaded it, scheduled it for later, went out, didn't check Twitter, and then by the time it goes out, Ali Gold's come out and said Santiago Jimenez isn't the guy. He's not on our list, which um, kind of made the whole first 15 minutes of the video a bit pointless. So apologies about that, but you stuck with it anyway, and uh, you hang hung around for the other names and the other news views and clues that were there. But I've got to apologize. Own it when you screw up. But listen, for what it's worth, I, I don't know Ali Gold personally. I've never met him, but he seems like a lovely guy, and he's obviously very helpful and useful as someone who is a journalist of the football club and and has some inside track. But it doesn't mean that he's right 100% of the time. And like no one, no one's right 100% of the time, you know? But who cares? It, it is what it is. Let's talk about some Tottenham stuff. So he said, Santiago Jimenez is off, right? I'm saying, why? why? Why are we distancing ourselves? Why are we kind of giving out the noise that we're not interested in him? We're not interested in Sir Hu Garassi, apparently that Jonathan David is our number one top pick of the day or of the week, that Ivan Tony is no longer of interest to us. Like, I don't understand the, the logic in distancing yourselves from these players if you mean it. If you don't mean it and it's a way of trying to, I don't know, expedite or throw people off the scent or whatever, then fair enough. But for me, I feel like the number nine is a super important position. You know how I feel about Jonathan David, right? I've come, we spoke about this a couple of days ago. 47 games, 26 goals, nine assists. So 35 in 47, two in three. Apparently he's available for 25 million. Apparently Lil are, are on board with him leaving. He's only 24. So the question marks around him are, do you like him as a player? Do you rate him? as someone that can transition from that level to the next? And does he fit the system? And on the idea of the transition from one level to the next, you don't know until you know. He came out with a statement, I think it was last year, saying he's destined for the Premier League. So he has a lot of faith in himself. Um, but like I say, whenever I've seen him play, I've always, he's always stunk the place out for Canada and for Lille. But then then you check back in two weeks later and he's gone and scored, scored four goals. in the in the meantime. So I don't know, maybe he's just someone that likes to perform when I'm not looking like the double split experiment, you know, like that scientific double split qu quantum mechanics thing. It, it only happens when you're not looking or it only happens when you are or something, when you're observing it. I don't know, whatever. Someone in the comments can educate me on what I just said. Um, but the other argument is he's a pacey player. He's a pace merchant. And I look, I love pace. Don't get me wrong. He's good. He can finish with both feet. He's he's a good player, I guess. I just I just haven't seen enough of it to think that I want him as my number nine, and it's such a key crucial position. So then you kind of go to, well, does he fit the system as the last model, the last the last node? And I don't think he necessarily does. Um, whenever if you go and take a look on his highlight reel on YouTube, I've obviously done the Y Scout deeper dives, but if you look on the, just the highlight reel, a lot of his action comes from being on the break, picking the ball up, and running and driving into space. How often does that template uh, emerge these days under Ange since the, the halfway point of the season? 85% of the teams in the Premier League, including some of the big four or five or six, are now happy to give us the ball, happy to sit back and happy to, to counter us. 
and we are happy to play into their hands. And so accordingly, I don't necessarily think that his best asset, his best attribute is going to be a natural fit unless the template of how to change, how to uh, play against us changes. And what that requires is better wingers. Said before, once they realized last season that the flat back four that considered the width, considered the, 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 the wide men that were hugging the touchline, once they realized that that was our weak link and that they couldn't dribble, take players on and put a decent cross in, then they went narrow and they gave the extra two yards to the guys on the touchline. The, the next five dropped deep. It all compressed James Madison. It affected him. It affected um, Benton Corbin, who was available. It definitely affected uh, Bissouma a little bit deeper in the pitch because there was just more crowd there. And he wasn't able to break the first man like he did in the first 10 games and then find a through pass or a, a progressive pass into someone with space. So that that anomaly to our kind of system, that lack of ability to trust the wingers or lack of fear factor is... Uh, is crucial to solve for. And so on that basis, I am okay with Tottenham getting a Jonathan David. If I don't I don't want it, but I'm okay as long as that means that the budget that we that we've got left over and it should be healthy. It should be. And I've got a story about that by the way regarding the hotel, so stay tuned. Um because it might not be as healthy as I was hoping, but Jonathan David's value goes up in a world where we get better wingers coming in because it creates more space and it creates more uh, utility. Um, and so if you're making the argument, and a lot of the, a lot of the Levy out guys will be saying, typical Tottenham, typical Levy, always going for the cheaper option. Well, let's compare a few of the other guys that are out there. Jimenez, 41 games versus Dave, David, 47. 26 goals a pop, nine assists a pop. One of them's 25 million and he's 24 years old. Jimenez is apparently 45 million and 22 years old. So twice the price, couple of years younger, similar level of risk of the unknown around the step up to the Premier League. Different types of player, for sure. Uh, Jimenez is more technical. I really like the guy because I think he's re very, very classy with his technical, his first touch, his ability to read the game, his footballing IQ. Those are the things that I appreciate probably as a football fan more than just you know outright physical um, pace and attributes that kind of just represent that you're an athlete more than a technician. That's just my take. But for me, um, Santiago Jimenez is a completely different type of player to, to Jonathan David. Scores about as many goals. I'm not sure the difference between the French and the Dutch league is arguable. But if it's twice as expensive, and that's the reason why Tottenham are moving in a different direction, then again, that's going to trigger some Levy out, guys. I get it. And I would still, I'm getting triggered by it as long as we can go and put the money elsewhere and where you really need to see improvements for me is in a specific six and in a winger. And when it comes to the wingers, before we get to that, sorry, let me just finish the point because I've got a note here. If it's about the valuation and the valuation only, and we're comparing similar stats, similar goals, similar assists, similar age to a degree, then why aren't we looking at Sir Garassi, who's got 30 goals, and three assists in 30 games, which is a better ratio, doing it for Stuttgart in a stronger league. People call the German league, the Bundesliga, a farmer's league because traditionally it's only ever had one team that dominates. But actually, if you look at how far the German teams went in Europe this year, you know, there's an argument to say it's just one of the strongest, if not the strongest league in, in Europe last season. Um, so I'm just wondering why it is like, if, if the notion is let's go for someone young, let's go for someone cheap rather than paying uh, the additional risk but twice as much, then isn't doesn't Garassi tick all those boxes because he's got a release clause of 15 million pounds. Now, obviously, there's variables. Maybe other teams are advanced. Maybe he wants to go to a certain place where he's going to get more minutes. Maybe whatever, right? There's a thousand, a thousand things we don't know. But I'm just saying there's three names there. All of them um, are the names that we keep hearing because once again, like I've been saying, it's the driest striker market for years. So many teams are looking for a nine. So few teams have them that want to sell them. And on top of that, loads of the players that we thought might be available, like the Openders, like the Sescos, like the Goikares, like all of those sorts of players are now coming out and making statements that they're actually happy staying where they are, which means, again, the supply goes down even more. 
the teams that were competing that are above us in the pecking order that were going after other targets maybe now they're cramping our style and coming on and therefore we have to pivot i'm not sure i don't know none of them really excite me but i'll only be on board it if we get a winger that can really terrify and terrorize uh, defenses and i don't think we have one in what we have at the moment on the roster and so i i want to see us spend the difference spend that 50 60 million quid on someone that can either just be a take on specialist that's one of the best in the world like a rafinha type of guy if that's the way you want to go fair enough or maybe players that are a bit more utility that can do it on both sides that aren't necessarily um specialists in one maybe they're more kind of uh, jacks of all trades like i don't know a danny olmo love danny olmo like he's so technically gifted he's better at what james madison is brilliant at and he can play wide he he can sort of control the tempo of the game even at that advanced position if you're playing horseshoe football like we have been and we will do at times next year he's the sort of guy that you need to to kind of to, to unlock um something so love it if we could go and get him and he can tick a few boxes is he a typical like a like a, an out and out terrorizer one on one specialist no but a name that is how about bakayoko johan bakayoko don't know why we're not looking at him nottingham forest were unfortunate not to get that deal done last year i think he would have been uh, a really really uh good player in the premier league and i'd be happy to see him coming to tottenham what about the the, the, the big old names that are coming out of germany like Gnabry and sane like w w are we like do we just assume that they're going to say no is it the money is it the salary i don't know but you know, we have got the lowest wage to turnover ratio in the Premier League by quite a way now. I think it's 44%. So, you know, we've got wiggle room to go and 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 get a statement signing done. And if that's not going to come in the form of a nine, then it better come in the form of a winger or in the six. I don't want to see a statement signing coming in and playing 50% of minutes behind Mickey van der Ven. As much as I'd like a really top quality left-sided centre-back and left-back like a Calafiori or a Jared Branthwaite, as much as I'd love all that, the amount of money it's going to cost and the absorption of the budget when, when there's more important things to fix in the first team, for me, you have to kind of make decisions around prioritising. So, like, how about Pedro Gonçalves? We speak about him every year. I don't understand why he he hasn't, like, moved onto... A bigger league, a better challenge. He's he's so so technically good, so interesting, so creative. He can play anywhere, like anywhere. And I don't know what his current price or availability or happiness levels are. I haven't looked into it, but I just thought of his name and I'd, and I'd throw it out to you. But like, that's the sort of name I'd love to get excited about. Even Andreas Skov Olsen at Bruges. I know some of you are probably going to go. I know you keep talking about him, Sean. But like, come on, he's not really the top tier. Mate, the guy bangs in 25 goals a year from a wing from a winger spot. He is a very, very, very clever young player and will go on to be a very gifted and successful individual. And uh, we need wingers that can score goals and pop up in the right position. He drifts. So if the ball's on the left, he drifts into the right spot. He's got just this ability to kind of read where the... You know, like Harry Kane's always in the right place at the right time. Skov Olsen seems to have that little sort of thing about him as well. So massive fan. Again, not a typical winger, winger like we want, but I don't see why we can't look at him. What about go to Napoli and Karach Carvey or however you say his name? Let's drop drop the money on him. Let's see what they'd say. You know, let's get excited. Let's get something going, guys. Because uh, at the moment, all I'm hearing is Milan are turning away from Emerson Royale because Tottenham won't lower their lower their requirements. Well, Milan won't raise their requirements. All right. Screw you. And maybe that means that the Hoybier deals in jeopardy and Emerson deals in jeopardy. For what it's worth, Emerson came out with a statement last night and I feel sad because it's just almost as bad as the timing of my video with regards Santiago Jimenez. Um, Emerson's statement came out about the same time as Milan apparently distanced themselves from the, from the story. He said, uh, and I quote, the truth is that nothing is defined yet. Obviously, I know that Milan are in contact with Tottenham. They have asked for information about me. For me, it's very gratifying because many Brazilian players have played for, for Milan. Let's wait and see what will happen. The Milan shirt is a very important and meaningful one. Knowing that teams like this are following me makes me very happy. But it makes me very happy that he's very happy because I like the guy. I, I like people that are autodidacts that go after self-improvement. And he um, showed to me a level of dedication to his own development during the COVID period or the end of COVID. Uh, I think it was COVID. 
to um to try to replicate and become the best version of himself like he's limited in what he can do for sure and maybe he's not the right guy for Tottenham but I will never ever remember him in any other way other than fondly because I think he's a nice guy good guy and I wish him well if he does leave and when you're saying those sorts of things you're talking about a club that don't own your signature don't have your contract don't pay your wages then he's got to be confident that um that the move is definitely happening and he's been told he's not of interest let me get through some other stories for you guys because I've got one to finish with that I think um, you're probably going to lose your mind over regarding... It's a financial story, but you've got to have to listen to it. Just quickly, um, last word on Spurs came out and uh, regarding the, the striker topics and said that Tottenham are also still very much interested in Dusan Vlaevic, who in 33 games last season, 18 goals and three assists, so 21 in 33, about two in every three again. Um, yeah, look, Vlaevic splits opinion it's going to be expensive. Is he quality? Yes. Is he going to score? Yes. Uh, does he fit the system? I believe so. Can he play back to goal when we're doing that kind of low block, trying to compete in that regard? 100%. Strong, powerful, finishes with both feet, good in the air. There's nothing not to like about him, but he's going to cost a lot of money. And he also hasn't been tested at the pace of the Premier League. And there's always that unknown. But that unknown exists for everybody. Apart from Ivan Tony. It doesn't exist for Ivan Tony. The unknown for Ivan Tony is whether he's going to relapse on his gambling. And if he's actually addicted to gambling, then that could happen because apparently gambling addictions are the like up there with the very most difficult ones to, to overcome. Um, personality stuff aside, like I've got no idea if the guy's a good guy or not, but I don't understand why everyone's walking away from him um, Arsenal aren't interested now. Chelsea aren't interested. Tottenham aren't interested. Something must have been said or done by somebody to to kind of put him off. Or maybe it's just the asking price. One year left on a 28-year-old and they want 50, 60 million quid. But you know what? When it comes to footballing risk, there's very little in Ivan Tony, in my opinion. He's done it in the Premier League. And uh, I think he is the best available in terms of a, of a player. As a player that we need, that can fit and suit us. I think that he is better than all of these other names on here. I understand the valuation, though, is too much at 50, 60 million. I do get that. Um, let's move on. There's a lot of stories here. Sorry, I've been talking for a long time. Vanderson to PSG. Uh, also, uh, Gerstruida to PSG. 25 million euros. Florian Plettenberg has been putting out these stories regarding... Um, PSG. Uh, apparently, now we've got Aston Villa who are trying to sell Matty Cash and are looking for a replacement right back. And so, any right back we're linked with, they are. And now PSG are too, not because they're trying to replace Hakimi, but they want competition for him. And look, Gerstreid is 25 million. For me, I know that Tottenham are trying to focus on priorities, first team priorities. And I already mentioned we need to be focusing on that stuff. But sometimes, if that means that you're delaying one deal, whilst you're focusing on others, and those deals are currently being um, held up because of the Euros or because of a bidding war or because of stubborn clubs. If there is a deal to be done there with Feyenoord for 25 million for Gareth Druida, I wouldn't want to miss it for a biscuit, if I'm entirely honest. Because I do think that we can still find a, a, a home for, for, for um, Emerson Royale. Let's move on, though. Alan Hutton suggesting we could hijack the United deal for Jared Branthwaite. United bid 35 million plus 8 million in add-ons being turned down um, by Sean Dyche. And apparently they're walking away. Um, I'll tell you what, this story is just, it's just silly. He is a left-footed, left-sided centre-back. I believe he's left-footed. I'm pretty sure he is, but he's definitely a left-sided centre-back. And they are a rare breed. If they're very good and they're very young and they're homegrown, they're going to cost a fortune. And I think that maybe Manchester United have taken a slice out of the Daniel Levy book and probably misread the market and thought that Everton's FFP situation wasn't going to be helped or sorted out by teams that they're supposed to compete with in Villa, in Chelsea, and in Newcastle. These guys have all scratched each other's backs to the point now where they all get to keep their best players, it looks like. So um, Man United putting in a derisory £35 million plus £8 million add-on bid is crazy. But if, Tottenham, if Alan Hutton thinks Tottenham are going to hijack the deal, well it's going to require a lot more than that. And I just don't see Tottenham spending 50, 60 million quid 
of our precious budget on a player that's going to play 50% of the minutes absent an injury. So let's move on. Uh, I've told you about Emerson Royale's story, haven't I? I have. By the way, I've moved away from uh, from my little notepad with scribbles all over it. Now I'm on the I'm, I'm print, printing things out. Let's get through some of this stuff real quick. Uh, Aston Villa are set to sign Illing Jr. Uh, that's absolutely fine by me. He was the least of interesting uh, left wingers that Tottenham were linked with. HITC are reporting that West Ham, <laughs> check this out, have rejected an inquiry from Tottenham for Jared Bowen outright. They they told us apparently that £150 million is what would be required to take him. And the phone was put down pretty quickly. I'm not sure if it's true. Can't believe it would be true. But funny nonetheless. Could never see Jared Bowen playing in a Tottenham shirt, even though I think he's one a wonderful, wonderful player. And Ali Gold talking about Eberechi Eze says that Ange is desperate for Eze. Um I personally, like I've said before, guys, I just don't see us triggering the clause. He's a skillful player to watch. Um, does he fit into Tottenham's system? I've asked you this question every every single time. I don't think he does naturally, not to the point where you'd want to drop all that money up front on him and then figure out later. If it was if it was less money or the up or the installments were different, yes, then yes, of course you'd want a player as good as him in your squad and you'd work it out, but um, I just think it's going to be too difficult. So I've, I've literally dialed down my as a sort of um, radar. Just don't think it's going to happen. He works best in a system anyway, where he is given a free role up front to join the attack and play killer passes. And in our system, the, the front has to has to defend. They have to all press and things. And I'm not sure if that's really what we've seen from Eze before. So I, I just not I just not particularly on the same page as as Ange around the around the suitability. Apparently, we're still keen on Xerxy, but United are front-running for him at the moment. Um, you know how I feel about Xerxy. A lot of you think he's the next big thing. I haven't been impressed when I've seen him, but doesn't mean I'm right. Probably wrong. You're probably right. And we'll move on. Apparently, two players from Tottenham are up, uh, maybe surplus to requirements. Eves Basuma and Richarlison, and that they would both con uh, bids for the, for the pair would be considered by Tottenham, according to Ali Gold, which is interesting because... You know, I've been making the point for ages. I think we've got too many eights and I don't think we have enough sixes. Eves Basuma for me isn't a good six. Just like when you look at the England team and you see Declan Rice uh, trying to play in the six, it doesn't really work um, just because Bellingham's in front of him and whoever's the 10 in front of him, like you're, you're shoehorning. And I think we are shoehorning not because we've got quality everywhere that needs to play, but because we just don't have a specific six. But we do have too many, too many players that are quite similar in that eight role. and. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be against if Hoybier left, I wouldn't also be against selling a second one of those midfielders, given that you've got Pape Sar, um, you've still got Low Celso at the moment, you've you've got um Benton Core, obviously uh the young fella from Sweden, Bergeval, you know, hopefully someone coming in and then we'll see if there's a chance to promote someone from the youth team or go again if we can do. I, I don't think Ease Basuma has been been a um something to write home about in a Tottenham shirt across two managers now. So let's move on. Uh, this is the story I want to talk to you about. Um, it's about finance, right? And about an investment into the football club. Paul Robinson was talking about this, the ex-goalkeeper on the Football Insider podcast. And he said, um, he was speaking exclusively, sorry, to Tottenham News. He said, Daniel Levy has always been looking for investment to strengthen the club, to strengthen the business with the club's best interests at heart. With the way that the club has grown off the field, the only thing that has dragged behind is the team on the pitch. We go on about the state of the art training ground, the best training ground in the world, the best stadium in the world, the potential NFL training ground, the potential links with the NFL, having the best stadium in the world for concerts, the go-kart track. So the structure of the club is very, very sound. Correct. And that should never be um, ridiculed or mocked, by the way, by people. Um, I know people feel strongly about Daniel Levy and think that he's always been distracted by all this stuff, but uh, it's been a meaningful needle mover. And, you know, absent FFP and PSR rules that have teeth, absent a gazillionaire owner that came in early enough to be able to set up an MCO like Manchester City, absent someone like Roman Abramovich who didn't mind losing two billion as he walked away from the football club because it was a toy. Absent that, I think that. Daniel Levy working to a different MO done very well. Anyway, sorry, I'm not rambling. I'll, I'll continue with the the uh, um, 
the the quote any more investment that comes into that because i suspect tottenham are at, um, an attractive position i don't think will be a cheap thing and it won't be done without great thought or in-depth due diligence that type of investment is only good to be a good thing for the club well yes yes and no depending on who you get and what the money's for it all comes down to what the money's for now remember if someone came in and bought 40% of the of of the the club just for example like was mooted a couple of weeks ago that money can't just go and sit onto the books unless it is added as debt onto the club and even then i think there's rules around how much you can add on as debt every year to the tune of i think it's that 90 million of the 105 that you can lose in the previous rules i'm not sure what the new rules look like under the squad the squad spend ratio but in any event, Daniel Levy and Enid will probably take some of that money out unless they want to keep it in the club for other things. And some of that will be on the field. Some of that will be off the field. Maybe it's for the NFL training ground. Maybe, and this is where I wanted to go with it, it's for the hotel. And I know this is going to irk you and irritate you. If you're still watching this right now and you're a Levy out, then God bless you. But this is going to irritate you. But I did some digging last night because I was surprised how lo how difficult it was to find out any relevant, new, up-to-date information around who it is that is paying for or where the money came from for the hotel. Now, bear in mind, the hotel, I believe, I could be wrong on the specifics, but the initial planning permission from Haringey Council was given in like 2013 when the stadium and the plans for everything were put together. Then when the stadium cost twice as much because of the commodities boom and because of everything that was happening in 2015, 2016, there was an economic you know, um, a cluster muck with regards to the commodities market. I, I remember it very well. And the initial budget basically went from, what was it, 450 million to a billion. So, you know, more than doubled. Uh, and I know that some of you think that a lot of that came down to Daniel Levy changing and epping around with plans, but not to the tune of double the cost. It was because of the cost of um, of the work, the cost of the raw materials, the cost of labor, et cetera, all went through the roof in that particular industry at that particular time. Same reason why Chelsea still sit in Stamford Bridge. They had a plan to move, um, to, to rebuild Stamford Bridge and couldn't do it. Same reason why Everton have just spent or are spending a billion pound now on a stadium that doesn't have any of the complexity that Tottenham Hotspurs does and is in a nice open area. And that is going to cost them over a billion pound. The point of all this is that on that, when I finally found some information regarding the cost of the hotel, it alluded to the fact that it was paid for as part of the loan when we got the stadium, the billion, the, the billion pound loan, give or take. But then planning permission for the hotel got put off. And the initial cost estimate for the hotel back in 2013 14 was 62 million pounds. Since then, they've added an additional 17 floors or something and about 50 different rooms or whatever else. And obviously, we're now 10 years later, 10 years into uh, prices that have only gone up. They haven't gone down since. And so I believe at an estimate, and it's a rough estimate, don't quote me. You might be able to find some up-to-date data on it, but I believe that the hotel will cost more like 200 million than the 62 million pound that it was supposed to. And I think that that is why um, there might be a finance gap with regards what money was left in the Haringey Council initial capital bid for the debt for the hotel. 10 years later, Prices are different. Inflation has gone through the roof. Um, not, not an ideal situation. In my, I, I'm listen. I'm guessing. I'm speculating, but I do think that that, in no small part, is why we're looking for investment. I think it's to help with that as much as it is to help with anything else with regards putting money into the playing team. And as I said, you're limited by what you can do with that regard anyway. But I just wanted to let you know that I do think that there are. Uh, ex, um, extraordinarily higher costs in those other ventures that were baked, the prices of which were baked in 10 years ago, pre Russia, Ukraine, pre um, hyperinflation, pre cost of living crisis, pre COVID, pre money printing, pre all that stuff that happened over the last four or five years. And so 
Yeah. Maybe that's why the budgets on the players are a bit diluted at the moment. I'm sorry if this sounds terrible. Again, like I say, I don't know this for, for sure. I was just doing some, some digging last night. Last thing I'll say, Jesus, 30 minutes. Last last couple of stories for you whilst I'm on the idea of commercial uh, stuff. Um, so you know Chris Davies is leaving the club to join Birmingham, the assistant manager. That obviously still needs to be resolved. As too is, according to the Northern Echo, Mark Thrower, who was a strength and conditioning coach at Tottenham. He's decided to leave and return back to the Northeast. Um, so that's another replacement we have to... Resolve, I don't I don't know. That just sounds like a physical therapist to me, right? They're 10 a penny. I'm sure there's some sort of dilution of value because he'll know the players and know the specifics and a, a new guy will have to learn it. But let's be honest, the uh, the medical side of of um, our of our historical coaching team are not nothing to write home about. And the last one is Todd Klein has left for Chelsea. That we knew that was happening. Todd Klein has left, but his gardening leave is done. And he's left some pretty big holes in terms of unfinished business. We still need a shirt sleeve sponsor. We still need a, tra a training ground sponsor that's agreed um, because of what happened with the Getir, the Turkish company, the, the delivery app that went bust. And it looks like Tottenham have lost 10 million pounds there. I don't know if we'll be able to recover any of it. But when it comes to bankruptcy, um, especially with over overseas, I don't know the Turkish law, but generally speaking, um, sponsored deals commercial relationship deals like that will be at the very bottom of the payout list um ahead of uh i'm not even sure if getty were listed on the stock exchange but if they were then you certainly whatever money goes to um essentially premium shareholders first people that pay a little bit more for for voting rights and for um for, and for some sort of protection in that regard so it looks like we'll have lost the 10 million quid um and the last thing he didn't obviously sort out was the naming rights still on the stadium. Now, for me personally, I don't think it's a problem. Like I say, I think that there's a lot of intangible value to being called the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. We are the second fastest growing footballing brand in America, in no small part because when Beyonce and Pink and everyone comes over, if they bring American tourists that may not be into football, they may then remember the name. If they ever do decide to get into football, then Tottenham might be their, their choice. Same with the NFL, same with rugby, same with F1. All of those things that are ridiculed and and mocked by a lot of people that hate Daniel Levy, remember that they are diversifying the requirement for Tottenham's revenues to come from you and me. I don't know what slice it is, maybe 35, 40%. I think it's the largest slice of our revenue now comes from commercial deals. I don't know what slice of that belongs to the go-karts or the skywalk or the concerts or whatever else. But in a nutshell, a very significant slice of the revenue that Tottenham generates to the tune of probably over a hundred million pound comes from people that are not Tottenham fans. And that is a great thing. It's a great thing because if we're trying to compete and people lose their mind about their, uh, ticket prices going up by a pound, then um, imagine what he would be up to if he didn't have access to Beyonce fans and Taylor Swift's and Red Hot Chili Peppers or whoever else. Uh, interesting that Taylor Swift is here, by the way, and didn't choose Tottenham as a as a as a venue. That, that's maybe maybe it's just not big enough for her um, crazy fan base. Anyway, guys, that's a massive in that's a massive update for you. I'm sorry, I've been rambling, but I hope you got some tidbits there. Um, let me know your thoughts. Also, last thing I'll say, I always forget to do this. Can you please follow me on Spotify? I'm trying to get the, the podcast thing going. Once I get Apple done, I'll put that link in there as well. But if you do use Spotify, can you please, it's in the description, hit the link. Love you all. Like, subscribe and comment. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. See you next time.